Cryptid Hunters, Chapter 6, Laurel Lee A woman came into the library, and once again, Grace was distracted from her uncle's book. She closed it and quietly scooted back into the shadows. The woman was short, slender, fit-looking, and very tan, as if she'd been baked in an oven. She must be part of Uncle Travis's merry band of pirates, Grace guessed. She had short red hair and wore running shorts and a tank top. Hanging on a chain around her neck was a yellow tag. Her feet were bare. She was carrying a black plastic bag which she placed carefully on the table near the sofa. Although the woman was at least as old as her uncle, she moved like a much younger person. There was a lightness to her, something almost bird-like, that Grace found fascinating. Like Grace, the woman spent a long time before the glass case, staring down at the book, then walked over to the aquarium and looked at the occupants. When she finished, she took a deep breath, lifted her arms straight out from her sides, and started walking in a straight line very slowly, one foot in front of the other, as if she were a gymnast performing on a balance beam. Grace thought it must be some kind of yoga exercise. She walked all the way across the library in this manner and was halfway back to the fireplace when she was interrupted by Petey running in, ready to do battle. Aren't you adorable? the woman said, ignoring the poodle's high-pitched yapping. She held her hands out and Petey surrendered unconditionally by jumping into them without the slightest hesitation. You little coward, Grace thought. Your bite is no bigger than you are. The woman was cuddling and cooing over the tiny canine when Wolf limped into the library without his cane, an angry scowl on his face. I'm Dr. Travis Wolf, he said gruffly. He acts as if he's going to make her walk the plank, Grace thought. If she's not one of his pirates, then who is she? The woman put Petey down, seemingly unperturbed by Wolf's fierceness. I'm pleased to meet you, she said. My name is Dr. Laura Lee. Snake, Wolf commanded, holding his pocket open. But the trick didn't work this time. Petey gave a defiant bark, then jumped back into Laurel's arms. Wolf's face turned crimson. She's fine. I love teacup poodles. Grace was beginning to really like Dr. Laurel Lee. Wolf towered over her, but she wasn't in the least intimidated by him. You're lucky you didn't die out there, Wolf said. Grace stifled a gasp of surprise. This was the person in the red kayak? I would have been fine, Dr. Lee said. You would have been crushed on the rocks, Wolf said loudly. My people risked their lives picking you up and ruined our helicopter in the process. I spent the last of my cash renting the kayak, she responded easily. So if you're suggesting I reimburse you for the rescue, you're out of luck. I'm suggesting no such thing. It's just, well, what were you doing out there? Dr. Lee did not answer his question. Instead, she walked over to the aquarium and looked at the fish again. Petey barked at them. These are very interesting specimens, she said. Very primitive looking. Coelacanths, aren't they? Of course, Grace thought, just like the name of the ship. The fish were discovered in South Africa by a woman named Marjorie Courtney Latimer in 1938, Dr. Lee continued. She went down to the wharf to see if the fisherman had brought in anything she might be able to put in her small natural history museum. On the deck of one of the boats was a fish, very much like these. That fish turned out to be the find of the century, a living fossil, a cryptid if you will, a fish that was supposed to have died along with the dinosaurs. Wolf's eyes narrowed with suspicion. Are you a reporter? Dr. Lee laughed. Hardly. I'm a cultural anthropologist, and to answer your question about what I was doing out on the water in a kayak, I was coming to see you, Dr. Wolf. Why? I'll get to that soon enough, but first I have some questions for you. For me? Wolf sputtered. Why? Tell me about Noah Blackwood, she interrupted him. Wolf stared at her in complete surprise. Grace was surprised too. Noah Blackwood was a famous conservationist. He had his own television show and several animal theme parks around the world called Noah's Ark. 
Marty and Luther were big fans and watched the show all the time. Even Dr. Beazel approved of Noah Blackwood. He had taken their class to the Noah's Ark in Paris on a school field trip. What does Noah Blackwood have to do with you coming here? Wolf asked. What's your relationship with him? Wolf gave a harsh laugh. We have no relationship, unless you consider being enemies a relationship. Rivals, perhaps? Ridiculous. But you did work for him. Briefly, a long time ago, and even then we weren't exactly fond of each other. Why? Dr. Lee asked. You are a reporter, Wolf said. I swear I'm not, but before I tell you why I'm here, I need to know more about you and Noah Blackwood. I've already made a terrible mistake with Dr. Blackwood, and I'm not about to make another one. Wolf stared at her for a few moments, then squatted down in front of the hearth and put a log on the fire. When he stood up, his attitude seemed to have softened a little. Okay, he said. What do you want to know? Who is he? What do you mean? I know he's one of the world's foremost conservationists. I've talked to a lot of people about him, and to a person, they have nothing but praise for his work. I watched a couple of his television shows, and I have to say, he's an impressive man. But there seems something beneath the surface. Something, I don't know. Something hidden, I guess. Wolf looked at her. You're very perceptive. Have you met him? No. I did manage to talk to him on the telephone a couple of times. He was pleasant enough, but... There was something. Noah Blackwood is a man absolutely void of love or compassion, Wolf interrupted. He lives totally for himself and his selfish needs. That's certainly not the personality he portrays on television. I didn't say he wasn't intelligent or charming, Wolf said. He's both, but he's not a conservationist. That image is nothing more than a clever mask he wears to get what he wants. A wolf in sheep's clothing? Something like that. As a renowned conservationist, Blackwood can go into the woods and do anything he wants. If there's a question about his activities, he puts on his conservation mask, and the doubts and questions vanish into thin air. Noah Blackwood would never do anything to harm an animal. The notion is outrageous. At least, that's how the thinking goes. What kind of activities? Noah Blackwood is a collector, Wolf said. His parks are nothing more than holding areas so he can make money off the animals before he harvests them. Harvest? Wolf made a throat-slitting motion with his index finger. You're certain of this? Absolutely certain. I've seen some of his so-called trophies. He has mounts that would turn the Smithsonian Natural History Museum green with envy. And I suspect that the stuffed animals are just the tip of the iceberg. Dr. Lee shook her head in disgust. Can we sit down? I'm feeling a little ill. Of course. Wolf moved some of the pillows on the sofa and they sat down. Petey seemed very content to stay in Dr. Lee's lap. Now, what's all this about? I'm not trying to be obstinate, Dr. Lee said, but I still need a little more information about you and Noah before I can tell you. Wolf sighed and gave her a reluctant nod. What did you do for Noah? I caught a great white shark for him, Wolf said. Grace wasn't certain she had heard correctly. She moved a little closer to the railing. Petey looked up at the balcony and started barking. Grace froze and held her breath, hoping they wouldn't discover her. Dr. Lee laughed. I guess she doesn't like sharks. She doesn't, but I don't think what, that's what she's barking about. He looked toward the balcony. Dr. Lee calmed Petey down by scratching her head, and to Grace's relief, the poodle stopped barking, and Wolf continued his story. After I graduated from veterinary school, Noah hired me to catch a great white for a Seattle Ark. At the time, no one had ever been able to keep a great white alive long enough to put it on display. Or since, I understand, Dr. Lee said. I read about this when I was looking into Blackwood's considerable accomplishments, but I don't recall seeing your name in connection with the shark. Blackwood was not into sharing the glory, Wolf said, which was fine with me. He paid us half a million dollars for that great white. Us? A friend of mine from college named Ted Bronson helped me. Ted knew virtually nothing about animals, but he knew everything there was to know about electronics and computers, which was a tremendous help. 
Ted is your partner in E-Wolf now. Yes. Wolf got up and started pacing. You see, the problem isn't catching great whites, it's transporting them. They either die on the way or within a few days after being put into the aquarium. Ted and I invented a shark transport box. The whole thing was computerized. Water flow, temperature, oxygenation. The box was a thing of beauty. We managed to catch a 14-foot great white and brought it to Blackwood, Seattle Ark. It lived for five years, and people lined up for miles to see it. I bet Noah made $10 million off that fish. And you only got half a million dollars? It was enough for me to get out of Blackwood's clutches, Wolf said, and enough for Ted and me to start E-Wolf. Blackwood wanted us to go out and catch more great whites for his other arcs. We refused. We wanted, he wanted to buy our transport box, but we wouldn't sell it to him. Why not? Laurel asked. It's not as if great whites are endangered. If I'd stayed at Noah's Ark, I would have been hooked, just like that great white I caught for Blackwood, Wolf answered, like everyone else who works for him. And if I'd sold him the box, he would have used it to transport endangered animals for his private collection. He would have used me. Mrs. Coutts is right, Grace thought. You can learn a lot by looking at the books a person reads, but you can learn even more by hiding among them. As Wolf recounted his capture of the great white shark, he was transformed into a different person. His limp was less pronounced and a gleam came into his eyes that had not been there before. So when you left the park, what did you do? Dr. Lee asked. Got E-Wolf up and running with Ted. Then, Wolf hesitated. You went to Lake Tully. Dr. Lee finished the sentence for him. There was a long silence. Grace could hear the snap of the logs burning in the fireplace. Finally, Wolf said, There are only a handful of people who know about the Lake Tully expedition. He locked his brown eyes on her. And you didn't learn about it by checking my background, Dr. Lee. There is no record of that expedition anywhere. You're right. Dr. Lee opened her plastic bag and removed a cardboard box. She took several crumpled newspapers from the box, then very carefully pulled out a large greenish egg. Wolf gently took the egg from her, which filled up both of his giant hands, and carried it over to the laboratory bench, where he examined it for some time before whispering as if a loud voice might break the shell. Where did you get this? I stole it. From whom? From Noah Blackwood. Where did he get it? From me, I'm afraid. Wolf gave her a quizzical look. Grace didn't understand either. What was Dr. Lee talking about? Three months ago, she continued, I was living with a group of pygmies near Lake Tully in the Congo, and I met an old friend of yours. Mazzolito? Wolf asked in surprise. Dr. Lee nodded. I thought they were an uncontacted tribe, but I learned that you had gotten there 14 years before me. He gave this to you? A going away present. As I said before, I've been in the field for years. Lake Tully was to be my last field project for a while. I had decided to return to the States and teach at a small private university in Florida. I thought it was time to share what I'd learned from the indigenous people I'd met around the world. She stood and walked over to the fire, still cradling Petey in her arms. But the plan changed when Mazlito gave me that egg. Did he tell you where he got it? He said it came from the nest of Mokalabembi. Must be some kind of rare bird, Grace thought. Wolf shook his head. There is no Mokalabembi. Not anymore. Mazlito said you might feel that way. Did he tell you why? Yes. In fact, he told me quite a bit about his friend Wolf. I bet he did, Wolf said. Look, I'm not saying the egg didn't come from Okalabembi, but it's obviously very old. He gave the egg a gentle shake. It's brittle, and there are some pieces missing. It could have been laid decades ago and preserved somehow. Mazlito insists that Mokalabembi is alive. After you left, he found a nest with three eggs. Two of the eggs hatched. You're holding the third. Really? Wolf gently set the egg back in the box and joined Dr. Lee in front of the fire. What happened to the two that hatched? The male died last year before I arrived at Lake Tully. The female is still alive, but 
She's not well. Did you see her? Dr. Lee shook her head. I begged Mausolito to take me to her, but he refused. He said that he had promised you that he would never show Mokalabembe to anyone. Wolf nodded. Mausolito has always been a man of his word. He squatted down and started poking at the fire again, then looked up at Dr. Lee. Okay, it's your turn. And you can start by explaining how Blackwood fits into all of this. Fair enough, Dr. Lee said. When I got back to the States, I started looking into Mokalabembe. I showed the egg to a few colleagues, and they su suggested I sent it to Gene Arc Laboratories to have it analyzed. Wolf cursed and stood. Blackwood's lab. I had no funding, Dr. Lee said, and they offered to analyze the egg for free. Of course they did. Wolf started pacing again. Noel Blackwood lives for unusual samples. God knows what he's doing with the genetic material. My sister and brother-in-law were going to look into it, but they were... He paused. Grace was stunned. Her parents hadn't said a word about this. In fact, she couldn't remember them ever mentioning Noel Blackwood's name. I read about the crash, Dr. Lee said. Is there any word? No, Wolf said quietly. Wolf walked back over to the sofa and sat down heavily. Dr. Lee joined him. Believe me, she said, I wouldn't have taken the egg to Jean Arc if I'd known what I know now about Blackwood. Tell me what happened, Wolf said. Several weeks went by and I didn't hear a word from them, so I called. They told me they had lost the egg. In a pig's eye, Wolf said. After several tries, I finally got a hold of Blackwood, and he told me that it would turn up eventually and that I shouldn't be concerned. The prelim preliminary result was that it was nothing more than an old ostrich egg. That egg looks no more like an ostrich egg than I do, Wolf said. Did you tell him where you got the egg? No. Did you tell him what you thought the egg was? No. Well, at least you did that right. I'm afraid there's more to it, Dr. Lee said. She went on to explain that her apartment and office had been broken into. All of her field notes were stolen. The day after the break-in, I was fired from the university without explanation. My bank account was mysteriously emptied, and all my credit cards were canceled. Wolf closed his eyes and shook his head. That has Blackwood written all over it, he said. Is he really that powerful? Wolf nodded. Mausolito is mentioned on nearly every page of my Lake Tully notebooks, Dr. Lee said miserably. Noah Blackwood and his henchmen break into your apartment and office, Wolf said. He had you fired with a simple phone call. He's one of the wealthiest men in the world, and he doesn't hesitate to use his money and influence to get what he wants. You can't imagine the things he's tried to do to me over the years. He couldn't afford to have you running around telling people about Mokalabembe or pursuing the mystery on your own. He arranged for you to lose your job to cripple you. That's how he operates. You're lucky he didn't have you killed. Grace found this difficult to believe. It was hard to picture the smiling, friendly, television face of Noah Blackwood as that of a murderer. Why would anyone make such a fuss over an old bird egg? How did you get the egg back? Wolf asked. I broke into the lab and stole it. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to find my field notes. A security guard interrupted my search. I told him I was the cleaning lady. I smuggled the egg out of the la lab in a mop bucket. Wolf laughed. You don't look like a cleaning lady, Dr. Lee. Laurel smiled. Thank you. And please, call me Laurel. Of course, and you can call me Wolf. Your field notes were probably sent directly to ba Blackwood anyway. I'm certain he's combing the country for you and that egg right now. I think he might have caught up to me in Utah. Someone smashed my engine and ransacked my camper while I was in the store. I had to hitchhike the rest of the way out here. Wolf gave her a look of open admiration. I shouldn't have taken it to Jean Arc, Laurel said. Wolf patted her hand. Forget about it. The question now is, what do we do about it? Blackwood has no doubt already sent a team to Lake Tully. And the timing stinks. My... He got up and started pacing again. My niece and nephew just got here today. Twins. I was going to spend the next few weeks getting to know them and settling them in. He gave a bitter laugh. The irony is that I was going to take them there eventually, but I sure can't take them on this trip. Take them where? Laurel asked. What are you talking about? 
Grace was asking the same questions herself. Wolf stopped. It will take a few days to get ready, but you and I, Dr. Lee, are going to Lake Tully. Why would Wolf want to take us to the Congo? Grace thought with alarm. On more than one occasion, Mazlito saved my life, Wolf continued. I'm not going to leave him out there for Blackwood's jackals to devour. We have to find him before they do. I'm not sure I'll be able to join you, Laurel said. I need to start looking for a job. You have a job, Wolf said. I just hired you. As what? You're my new chief anthropologist. Dr. Lee gave him a grateful smile. I guess I have no choice but to accept under the circumstances. But what about your niece and nephew? Wolf frowned. I might have to send them back to their boarding school. There's no time to arrange anything else. Grace nearly let out a cheer. What if Blackwood's men get to Lake Tully before us? They will, Wolf answered, but we still have an advantage. What's that? I know Mazlito's phone number, and they don't. What are you talking about? Mazlito doesn't have a phone. Is the Malimo still there? Yes, Laurel said. It's on the roof. What roof? What kind of animal were they talking about now, Grace thought. Good, Wolf said. Let's go find Phil and start figur figuring out what we'll need for the expedition. After they had gone, Grace pulled out the hidden ones and looked up Mokalabembi. It was not a bird. <laughs>